Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session with Bill Browder, author of Freezing Order, his new book. Uh, just before I start, and I'm only exempt from this because of the distance I am from the stage, would you please make sure that you keep your masks on for the duration of the talk and for the next hour? Thank you very much. Okay, and a very warm welcome to Bill Browder, who's uh, with us virtually from London. And Bill, we are speaking to you from Franschhoek in the Western Cape. It's a beautiful day here, and everyone is uh, enthralled that you are able to share your thoughts with us. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for making yourself available. Uh, Bill and I have a, a bit of personal history, but I'll get on to that in a minute. Can I just say that uh, this book, Freezing Order, for anyone who wants to understand the Putin kleptocracy is essential reading. Just as Bill's first book, Red Notice, and Bill can comment this in a sense as a continuation of where Red Notice left off, I think made the wider world aware of what was going on with uh, the Kremlin. We could also say, and Bill himself says it, that because of the events uh, in November 2009, when his lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, was uh, tortured, denied medical treatment, and then beaten to death in his prison cell in Moscow, that this alchemized bill from being one of the most successful, if not the most successful, private equity traders uh, in Russia to becoming a human rights crusader. Uh, the issue at hand, of course, has completely widened because of what happened on the 24th of February with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We'll get on to it. But Bill, before we do that, if I could just deal with some personal history. <laughs> when we first met, you told me a fascinating story, which isn't in the book. There's, there's a reference to two shady characters in this book from South Africa. But you told me that at the heights of the Magnitsky crisis after his murder and you'd started to campaign, you wanted to decompress. So you took your wife and you came on a holiday to Cape Town. And en route, as I recall, please correct me, you read <laughs> Donald Woods's book, Cry Freedom, which was about the murder in police custody of Steve Biko. And when you got to Cape Town, you wanted to find out more, so you discovered that Donald Woods had died. But there was one person who was the reporter, she also gets an honorable mention at the end of your book, who'd uncovered the cover-up around Biko's death, and her name was Helen Ziller. But she at the time was a premier of the Western Cape, but she spent many hours with you and took you through uh, what happened. And also how Biko's death in 1977 and police custody in Port Elizabeth internationalized the campaign against apartheid and the sanctions which followed. So could you just let us into that and tell us about your property purchases in Cape Town as well and what happened? Uh, so Tony, great to see you. Um, uh, I, 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 and I wish I could be there in person and I would be there in person with you and with everybody, except for the fact that I can't actually travel to South Africa um, and, and be safe because South Africa has a warm uh, relationship with Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin has been trying to um, get me back to Russia through Interpol and other organizations. And so I have a beautiful house in Cape Town. That's my favorite place in the world, my happy place. And I haven't been able to visit my house in almost a decade because of this problem that started pretty much with Zuma, but um, carries on till today. And in fact, um, we can talk, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the South African government's attitude towards Ukraine and towards Putin is something that I find deeply disturbing. But coming back to, to this story about Helen Zilli, um, so uh, I, 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 you make me sound actually a little bit more intelligent than I actually am. I didn't read his book. Um, I watched the movie. Um, oh, well. <laughs> More dramatic, at least. <laughs> um, and actually, what, what had happened was that my wife had 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 gathered up. This is back before we had streaming. <clears throat> she had gathered up a bunch of DVDs, like ten DVDs of different 
human rights movies to, to see if we could find some kind of solace and perhaps inspiration on what to do after Sergei Magnitsky's murder. And I watched a bunch of these movies, but the one that really spoke to me was this movie Cry Freedom. And the reason it spoke to me so profoundly was that um, it was just a comparable story. Steve Biko um, was fighting with, a, with an authoritarian regime, the apartheid regime. He stood up to them. They put him in police custody. They killed him in police custody. And then they covered the, all the different arms, tried to cover it up. And, and I watched this and I thought to myself, this is exactly what happened to Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei Magnitsky um, was fighting an author authoritarian regime, the, this, in this case, the Putin regime. He was fighting the Putin regime because um, he had discovered a massive uh, $230 million fraud that was committed by government officials um, against the country, his country, um, which involved some of my documents. Um, he testified against that. And then, as you mentioned, he was arrested, kept in pretrial detention, tortured for 358 days and killed. And then we had the same exact cover up. And so when I, when I, when I saw this B Biko film, I just thought, God, this is just so, so comparable. And, and, and the, the, the movie was all about um, this journalist who was trying to get the story out to the West. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I was just so moved by it. And, and as, as we all know, this was a, a central plank in the un, un, um, winding of this horrible apartheid regime. And, and so I, 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 um, you know, I, look, I looked up all, all the different characters involved. And as you mentioned, I found Helen Zilley. Um, was one of the key people to expose this in the West. And in fact, she had to go into hiding after she exposed it and so on. And I, and I was, I, I, and, and so I, um, uh, I wrote her a, um, a very sort of personal note. Um, uh, and she was the governor of the Western Cape. And I, I, so I wrote her a note saying, you know, asking for a meeting. And, and um, it was right around, I think it was New Year's Day that I wrote her the note. And, uh, I, I faxed it to her office and I never expected a response, but I just, I don't know, I just thought I'd put it out there and see what happened. And, and like within four hours of, of the note um, uh, getting to her office, she calls me and, and says, uh, I, was, I read your note and, and truly moved by, by the story. And um, I'm, I'm going to clear my schedule and um, Come to you, and I want to talk to you. And so the next morning, she she was the you know governor of the Western Cape, had a lot of important responsibilities, and she cleared her schedule, and came to my house, and and we sat all morning, and she told me the story of how um, of the whole Biko affair, and 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 then how she and others had stood up to the apartheid government, and 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 um, in the context of what I was facing, she she said you know Western sanctions are what ultimately um, changed the whole story for us. And that was the seed that, that she planted the seed that, that led eventually to after um, a number of years of getting the Magnitsky Act passed in the United States and, and now 33 other countries. And um, it really was a, a pivotal moment in my, um, in my whole process of recovering from, from the trauma of this terrible murder and, and finding some purpose and mission um, beyond just the heartbreak that I experienced. Well, that's <clears throat> extraordinary and how you did actually make it your life's purpose for the last 12 years to internationalize, not just the murder of Sergei Magnitsky, but the wider corruption in Russia, more particularly the human rights abuses. And can I just say on that, because it's very well described and very uh, gripping detail in this book, which is very accessible. We get onto your writing style in a minute. Um, that when the Magnitsky Global Act was passed by the US Congress, we discovered, I think it was two years ago when I was writing a book and I looked it up, that the infamous Gupta brothers <laughs> who had ransacked, or Sister Jacob Zuma to ransack the state here, had actually been targeted and sanctioned under the Magnitsky Global Act. And I, reading that, I thought to myself, there's something deeply appropriate. In a sense, not that the story begins, the story begins in Moscow, obviously, but the story is anchored at one end with your meeting with Helen Zilla in uh, Cape Town. 
And now at the other end, two of the great plunderers, or three of them, brothers, have actually been sanctioned by an act that you inspired in the name of your uh, murdered lawyer. Yeah, so I thought, that, I don't put a neat bow on things, but there was something seemed to me rather appropriately symmetrical about that. Yeah, it, re it really was coming full circle. And, and um, j just to give everybody um, a bit of context. So after Sergei Magnitsky was killed, um, we eventually came up with this idea, which was um, to freeze the assets and ban the visas of the people who killed him um, as a, in the West as a way of, of trying to find at least some, some type of redress. And I should point out that, that uh, there was such a cover up in Russia that nobody faced any kind of responsibility, even though we had unbelievably clear documentary evidence of his murder, of his torture, of the financial crimes that he discovered, of the everything. Um, but Putin got involved in the cover up and, and, and in fact, they gave promotions and state honors to the people who committed these crimes um, as opposed to punishing them. And so there, we came up with this idea, which is that, okay, we, we may not be able to get them for torture and murder um, in the West because we don't have jurisdiction, but why should we allow these people to um, spend their money in the West? And why should we allow them to travel to the West? These people all um, bought villas on the Côte d'Azur and, and um, had huge Swiss bank accounts and, and apartments in New York City and send their girlfriends on shopping trips to Milan and, and their kids to boarding schools in Switzerland. Why should we allow them to do this? And it seemed like something that at least wouldn't, it would make them feel pretty horrible if they, got, um, if they couldn't do that anymore. And so I went to Washington and um, I, I met with two senators, Senator John McCain, who's sadly no longer with us, who's, who was a Republican from Arizona, and uh, Senator Benjamin Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland. And I told them the story of how Sergei Magnitsky had uncovered this crime and how he had been arrested, tortured, and murdered for doing so. And I said, can we sanction, can we freeze the assets and, and ban, ban the visas of the people who did this? And these two senators said yes. And so in um, October of 2010, about a year after Sergei was killed, um, they came up with the draft Magnitsky Act and they put it on the books. And it was very um, interesting because the moment they put it on the books, the law books, all sorts of other victims in Russia started coming forward. And they said, you found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. Can you sanction the people who killed my brother, my husband, my sister, my aunt? And after about a dozen of these people came forward, these two senators said, we're, we, I think we're on something much bigger than um, uh, just the Magnitsky case. And they added 65 words to the law to sanction all human rights abusers in Russia. So the Magnitsky Act passed um, 92 to 4 in the Senate in, in uh, November of 2012. And it became a law um, in December of 2012. President Obama signed it into law. And Vladimir Putin went out of his mind. He, he just truly went crazy. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. He made it his single largest foreign policy priority to to um, uh, stop the Magnitsky Act, to repeal the Magnitsky Act. <laughs> and, and somehow he thought that that was going to, I don't know, change the events. But in, instead, what it did was it inspired these two senators to say, well, wait a second, if, if, if Putin and his crooks um, are so mad about it, I'm sure there's some other crooks and dictators around the world that would be equally mad. Let's make this global. And so, as you mentioned, in 2016, they passed the Global Magnitsky Act. And this doesn't apply just to Russians, um, it applies to everybody everywhere. And as, as you mentioned, <laughs> um, and I've been watching all this Gupta, disgusting Gupta stuff um, from, from London for many years and, and, and amazed and shocked actually that South Africa, even though these people were responsible for such hardship uh, in, in South Africa, that the government didn't have the ability or the will or, or something to prosecute them. And it was just a, such a glorious moment when, when the US government added these Gupta brothers um, to the global Magnitsky list. And, and let me tell you that when someone gets added to this Magnitsky list, it's, it's a life ruining experience. All of a sudden, um, uh, every bank in the world will, will stop doing business with you. Um, no multinational corporation will want to touch you. 
and you eventually uh, nobody will issue you visas, even if it's, if it's just the U.S. sanctioning you. No one will issue you visas, and so effectively you become a non-person in the world. And um, I, I was really, as you say, sort of a, a beautiful circular situation from the from those dark days with sitting with Helen Zille to to that moment when the, when the in South Africa to that moment when the Gupta brothers were were added to the Magnitsky list. You know, I don't want to make this too parochial, but we have a local audience here, very enthusiastic, with a very big audience, I must tell you, but you probably can't see because you're just looking at me. But uh, more is the pity. Um, but, but let me say that when I first read, read Notice, and this is the success of volume in a sense, and we were at the height of the Zuma state capture projects, which facilitate the Guptas ransacking the state, I'd, I'd returned recently from South America, where I'd been living for three years, and there's this fantastic saying, I think it was the president of Peru, who said, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. Uh, and that's exactly how Putin ran Russia. And it certainly, while Zuma was in charge here, was exactly how South Africa, Inc., was being operated, or the South African government, with all its law enforcement uh, arms as well, which were totally corrupted and corroded. What's interesting now that there's a better regime, it's not brilliant, we have, you know, Zoom is gone, is that they have started quite aggressively to use exactly what the title of your book is called, Freezing Orders, through actually freezing the assets of the uh, corrupt and the potentially criminal in order to later bring a criminal case. So it, in this, but to sterilize the theft that they've already had. So. This uh, title, quite aside from the contents, is, I think, going to resonate with a lot of folk here in South Africa. But, you know, going back to your book, it, it is, I mean, it's, it really could be a movie if it wasn't sort of a real-life horror story. It starts with you being arrested in Madrid in, in entirely trumped-up charges orchestrated from Moscow. There's a honey trap in Monaco, which you actually very... I thought disarmingly deal with saying, you know, you weren't an obvious target for a beautiful young blonde to, to go after. Um, <laughs> there's also a little sidebar there. We have another South African connection uh, because Prince Albert of Monaco is married to a South African and he emerges from this book as, you know, one of the great close friends of Vladimir Putin. And then you get a whole series of death threats. You then tried in absentia in Russia, I think there's a nine-year hard labor sentence that you've yet to serve in some appealing gulag. And um, so it goes on. And then this incredible, well-chronicled, hair-raising, I think the word is disinformatia, this disinformation campaign, where what actually happens, I don't want to give away the book, because everybody, there's a pile outside, and everyone's going to go and buy one, Bill. Um, the, but what actually happens is you are the victims. Sergei Magnitsky is very obviously the victim and dead. And yet through the disinformation campaign, the roles are reversed. And what Moscow and uh, the Kremlin does is to say, actually, you're the aggressor. You are the thief. You stole the money, the $230 million, and you should be in jail. And this extraordinary moment, it's just not believable, really, where Sergei Magnitsky the murdered lawyer of Bill and his company Hermitage is actually put on trial after he's dead. And that, that, that is just extraordinary, but it, it happens. That's Russia. Yeah, it's, it's, it's truly, truly extraordinary. Um, I just wanted to come back to the Latin America for, for a second. So it, it, the, you, you have this good quote from the, from the president of Peru. There's yes. another quote um, from, the, um, from Pablo Escobar when when um, when they, they when when he or his colleagues get were they, they they when they got sanctioned by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, where they where they basically froze their assets under some drug enforcement sanction program, um, it was the same. They put them on the same sanctions list as the Magnitsky sanctions go on to, and oh. and they had a reaction to this, and they called it morta civil, which means civil death. And effectively, the United States sentenced them to civil death. They can no longer do anything. And, and so there's another um, uh, uh, link to, uh, to Latin America from a, a, famous, a famous quote. But um, uh, the, those, the, all, all of those incidents um, you describe are, um, in a certain way, a microcosm 
of so I I was and Sergei Magnitsky was and our whole mission of getting justice it was just just a one one person story but it can be extrapolated out a million times now because um, the injustice that we faced the killings that we faced the the way that the victims are then blamed it's just the same thing that's going on in Ukraine right now on a massive scale you know we were one and now it's a million and um, Sorry, what I thought of when I was reading this book, I thought, well, this is precinct, because obviously this book was written and published before the 24th of, Fe or before the 24th of February, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And, and, and you've had some, well, you're in demand around the world to talk about this for very good reasons. So we'll get on to that. But I just talking, I mean, there were attempts to kill you and to kidnap you. But actually, aside from the horrifying murder of Sergei Magnitsky, other people were murdered, which yeah. you chronicle in this book. I mean, there is the very high profile case in 2015 of Boris Nemtsov being assassinated, gunned down within sight of the Kremlin. The security cameras were conveniently switched off. Uh, some lesser person was arrested, Chechen, I think. The real killers got free. And you explicitly state in the book, now, just Nemtsov, of course, was one of the highest profile opponents of Putin and had driven the enactment of the Magnitsky Acts throughout Europe. He'd been, the, in many ways, the face of it. And he, he was assassinated in 2015. And you very directly in this book say that Putin ordered his assassination. Yes. So Putin, there's no question in my mind that Putin killed Boris Nemtsov. And there's no question in my mind that Putin ordered the uh, murder of Alexei Navalny that didn't didn't that that failed that the assassination failed, and there's no question in my mind that he um, tried to kill um, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, who's who's a mention in my book, who was an, a, a protege of Boris Nemtsov, who picked up the mantle when when Boris Nemtsov after he was killed, and they poisoned him twice in Moscow. He survived. Sorry to interrupt. Marvelous euphemism. You talk about <clears throat> about his poisoning. Acute non-alcoholic intoxication was what the official <laughs> designation. Sorry, that means trivial. No, no. no. But, I mean, well, and, and in fact, the, the, that was the official designation by the hospital until um, uh, until somebody you know came around to sort of clean up the narrative, and then they said, "We well, we, we don't know. T totally mysterious why this guy has just gone into a coma and su suffered multiple organ failure." Um, anyways, my friend, friend Vladimir uh, Karamurza survived. He was also with me in different parliaments around the world lobbying for the Magnitsky Act. And he's now back in Moscow and they arrested him after he went on television on CNN and called Putin a murderer. An hour later, he was arrested and he's now being charged under this new law that's called the disinformation law about the war. And because he called the war a war, he's, he's, he um, faces 15 years in jail. And so, I mean, it's just the most hor horrific regime and Putin is a killer. And, and of course, it, you know, I, if I had come on, if we had had this conversation six months ago, you know, people would have been saying, oh, you know, the, uh, you, you've got some issues or, you know, you're exaggerating, you, you, you know. Yes, yes, no. um, well, you know, I mean, we see it every day. I mean, they're just bombing into oblivion, innocent men, women, and children. It's just unbelievable. But just to stick for one second with Vladimir Karamazo, who, I mean, was poisoned and managed to recover after a lot of interventions, some which led by you. I thought what was fascinating about that story, Bill, is you actually explicitly state, despite your earlier reservations, that clearly not every Russian official is bad. In fact, in a way, he was saved because there was a very, um, not only decent, but highly professional Russian doctor who, you know, assisted in his resuscitation. And I guess, you know, that, that leads us to another part of your book before we go to the big question of the Ukraine war. And that is, obviously, there's a rigged legal system in Russia, but there are some exceptionally brave Russians who stand up against it, or indeed, who stand up for basic human decency, which you correctly note. But then the other side of the ledger, you're an American, you live in London, you have an extraordinary indictment or series of indictments in your book about the American legal system. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's this fantastically named character. In fact, you know, you Hollywood 
central casting convention. His name is John Moscow, <laughs> but <laughs> he's actually a New York lawyer. And he lands up, he starts off working for Bill and Hermitage in the asset seizure case. And then a few months later, lands up effectively working for the Kremlin. And an 83-year-old judge, Grisa, uh, who had a big role in the issue with uh, Argentinian debt incident, which I was, that's how I knew his name, lands up saying there's no conflict of interest, that somehow a, a New York lawyer can first act for the effectively plaintiff, or you weren't the plaintiff, but an interested party on the plaintiff side, and then act for the defendant, and that's perfectly okay. And, and there is a series of issues here with the United States, let's call it administration of justice, which frankly leave a lot to be desired. Well, so, so um, yeah, so, I, so here, here I, so I hire this guy, John Moscow. He, he was a former prosecutor, one of the top prosecutors in uh, the New York district, district attorney's office who prosecuted some of the biggest money laundering cases. He went into private practice. Um, everybody said, when I said, I need a lawyer to help me find out who got the money that killed Sergei Magnitsky so we can then deprive them of that money. And then everyone said, go to John Moscow. He's the man, he's the genius. So we, we, um, we hired John Moscow. He comes up with a great idea. This is a very clever idea, which is, that even if the money was sent from one Russian bank to another Russian bank, for a brief moment, every dollar payment in the world for a, for a fraction of a second has to go through a New York clearing bank. And he came up with this idea, which is that all the, all the information was actually in New York. Um, and we just needed to issue a subpoena to the clearing banks to get that information. And so he put together the subpoena request. This guy, John Moscow, then, um, he just ghosts us one day. Um, we carry on, and he stops working for us. It's just it was the most in, uh, unusual thing I've ever seen, where a lawyer, um, you know, who's on paying big money for on retainer, just disappears. But he did, and um, and then uh, uh, we 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 carry on. We're not going to stop because our lawyer has disappeared. And we we take the subpoena that he's drafted up. We we get the bank to, we go to the court and the court issues the, the subpoena against the bank. We get some information. We combine that with some other information. We build up, we put the pieces of the puzzle together. We find the money. The money went to a lot of different places, but one of the places it went to was to buy $20 million worth of luxury apartments in New York. And, um, and so I took this information um, uh, first to the New York district attorney's office to, a, to, a, to, the, um, to the guy who John Moscow had, had introduced me to, um, and uh, he opens a, a case. He then passes it to the federal prosecutors. The federal prosecutors then uh, freeze all the properties. Um, and, and then we discover that John Moscow is, not, <laughs> is working for the other side. And the first thing he does working for the other side is issues, he issues a subpoena against me to hand over all my personal security information so that the Russian government can get my personal security information, I, you know, pr probably to kill me. Um, and, and so it was, it was and, and then of course, we go to court to try to get him disqualified. And, and I think that you don't have to be a legal expert. I'm probably sure that like every single person who's sitting there with, with me today here, you um, understand that this is a conflict of interest. If you're a lawyer working for the victim, you can't go um, work for the perpetrator. And, um, and, and it's pretty obvious. But we took it to the court, and there was this 83-year-old judge. His name was Thomas Grisset, and he. And in America, there's no re, there's no mandatory retirement age for judges, and he was genuinely senile. The guy could not understand. He couldn't could barely hear, couldn't think, and he couldn't understand that there was a conflict of interest. and And uh, and so he he refused to disqualify this John Moscow character, and it was only through like a couple of a couple more years of like legal torture by John Moscow and his colleagues trying to basically get all information they could, basically getting asking the court, asking Judge Grisset to effectively take our computer server so they could go and mine it for whatever information they thought would be useful to their client who was part of the Russian government. And, um, and we eventually stopped the whole thing when we went to the appeals court where, where like, you know, some properly sentient judges looked at it and like said, well, this is outrageous and, and, and got rid of him. And what was most interesting is that he and his law firm carried on secretly advising the Russians even after they were disqualified by the court. I mean, it's just the sleaziest thing you could ever imagine. And this is 
a major New York law firm, Baker Hostetler, was doing this. And, um, and, and so, you know, one of the things that I've learned in this whole uh, uh, justice campaign is that nothing works the way it's supposed to. Governments aren't, don't act the way they're supposed to. Lawyers don't act the way they're supposed to. Everybody is, is doing stuff that they're, they're not supposed to do. And um, it, it kind of ruins one's impression of the world when you think that, that the institutions that are supposed to protect you aren't protecting you and the people that are supposed to be helping you aren't helping you and, and people betray you left, right, and center for money. And, um, and, and the most evil man in the world, Vladimir Putin, seems to have everybody on, their pay, on, on his payroll. Bar you, which is a bit, uh, tells its own story. I mean, you, you describe one chapter you call whack a mole, where you actually tamp down one thing and then something else sprouts up, and you've got to deal with that, and you've got to be able to compartmentalize on an extraordinary basis, as you've done. Um, but can I just deal with something else, which is a feature of this book, a, a running narrative throughout? You talk about Putin's Western enablers. Now, obviously, the world has changed fundamentally after the 24th of February, or not pretty much it has, and I'm probably in a completely different era. But there's also quite a heavy indictment list here of people from prime ministers to even jurisdictions, Britain being one, you said their incredible lax attitude uh, actually allowed Putin to assume he could operate with impunity, with all the dirty money, with all the uh, crimes that were committed on British soil with very few consequences in reality. Um, and then a whole cast of characters ranging from a, a Republican California congressman to, to an endless stream of people who enabled Wall Street Journal journalists or, or others, who enabled Putin's disinformation campaign, not just against you, but against the cause of exposing what was going on in Moscow. Do you think that that is being fundamentally changed because of what happened, what's happening in Ukraine? Well, I think that everybody who's been a Western enabler of Putin is hiding under their table, hoping that, that nobody noticed what they were doing for the last 10 or 20 years. Some of them have been outed, a bunch of them haven't been outed. And, and uh, I was just literally, as, as we were um, preparing for this um, session today, I was just reading the news and I, and, um, I, I noticed that um, Emmanuel Macron, the um, newly re-elected president of France, um, was being criticized by the Ukrainian president, Zelensky. And, and Zelensky, so apparently Macron went to Zelensky and said, I think you, should, you need to make some concessions to Putin um, so he can save face. And, um, and I, I was just thinking to myself, um, you know, the, the, we, we need to make concessions to a murderer you know, the, the only people that need to be, the only thing that needs to be saved are Ukrainians, not Putin's face. And so, you know, this whole attitude, which, you know, that, that's from the, from a government, from a head of state level, but that's, that was the attitude that, that has permeated this whole thing. So I don't think we're finished with this whole you know, Western enabling thing. I think that everybody is on hold, trying, you know, look, trying to, all these people have made a lot of money off the enabling, look, looking for which way the wind is blowing, and they gladly sign up for Putin again, if they could do it without consequence. And, and let me just say one other thing, which is that, of course, Russia is now, you know, the evil empire, but, you know, the same group of enablers are working for the Saudis and working for the Venezuelans and working for all sorts of bad folk uh, around the world. And, and the whole enabling problem continues without any, uh, with, with one minor bump in the road as it relates to Russia. So talking about the most famous Trump uh, well, the most famous Western enabler in your book is actually the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. And there are extraordinary chapters here about what happened during the 2016 election campaign, both known, obviously, as the dossier and unknown. And then this moment, which you described in July 2018 at the Helsinki press conference, where there were 12 Russian uh, GRU officials who'd been indicted in American court there in Russia. And they just, this is now a press conference. And Putin says, well, we'd be, we'd be prepared to send them back to America for uh, questioning. And then we can do something about Bill Browder, to which Trump says, that's an incredible offer. <laughs> Could you just elaborate on that and how it made you feel at the moment you're watching this? 
Well, so so that so that was the day that I started writing Freezing Order. I, I had a lot, you know, I had all these incredibly incredible experiences and challenges and and um, discoveries um, prior to that. that and, and I really felt a huge necessity to write this book. It's, um, I mean, I, I, I hope that you all will all read it, but, um, uh, to, and, and I'm sure you'll be entertained when you do, but I really felt like it was important, not just for entertainment purposes, but for historical purposes to make sure that, that this, this terrible stuff that I've saw you know, is on the permanent record for everybody to know, and it hopefully becomes part of you know the historical narrative. And so, I really had a you know I had a, a a really important mission to write this book so that it's it was all there because all this stuff would just dr drift into into obscurity and oblivion if, it, if I hadn't. And so, that was the day that I started writing the book, and and I knew that the summit was taking place, but I didn't think it would have anything to do with me. It was just Putin and Trump, and I could read about it afterwards. And so, I I um. Uh, powered up my computer, I, and I d turned off email, and I turned off um, uh, notifications, and I put my phone face down, and I sat down to start writing this book. And um, the last book I wrote, Red Notice, took me three years to write, and and I I had written it back in in I think I finished it in 2014, and so this is 2018, and, and so it had been a long time since I had written a book, and it was much harder than I remembered writing. I, I was sitting there with this screen, this blank screen, and just really having a hard time getting my thoughts organized. And, and, and I, after about an hour, I had barely like a, a page to show for it. And, and I couldn't, and, and I was, I couldn't hold out any longer. So I turned my phone over just to see what was going on with messages and stuff. And there was like this unbelievable collection of messages that had accumulated with my, my notifications off of all people, um, journalists and people watching TV and everybody um, from this Helsinki summit saying, saying, Bill, are you, are you watching this? Um, and, and I, I, I then, I then um, got the um, link and watched it and there, and, and there was, um, you know, and it, Putin saying uh, he wanted me to be handed over. And, and that wasn't so unusual. Okay. Uh, Putin has, has been talking about me and I, 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 I have been already sentenced to nine years in absentia and they had been chasing me with Interpol warrants and he had been bringing up my name in all sorts of public settings. That, so that was something I was kind of used to. But what I wasn't used to and what just absolutely terrified me to the core was that the, the most powerful man in the free world, Donald Trump, was ready to hand me over. I mean, I, you know, and I was in America at the time. I, 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 live, I normally live in the UK and I'm actually a British citizen um, and I've been here in the UK for 32 years, minus the 10 years I was in Russia. Um, but I was in America at the time. And I, I thought that, that like four, you know, um, blacked out SUVs would show up where I was staying. And, you know, a bunch of marshal, federal marshals would come in and grab me and put me on a rendition flight back to Moscow, where I surely be killed. And that was really absolutely terrifying. And, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, so I, I would have thought that after Trump said that at the conference, that like, you know, immediately, like when he got on Air Force One, um, some advisor would tell him this is a really bad idea. You should, you should just um, walk that back. Um, but, but that didn't happen. And, um, and then and it was for three days, um, nothing happened. There was no word. And then, and then there was a pre another press conference at the White House and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who is the press secretary, was asked by the New York Times, you know, do you still intend to hand over Bill Browder? And she said, well, the president is consulting his advisors and he's thinking about it. And I, I thought, what? I mean, this is, this is like terrible. And so the Senate then the next day um, uh, decided to um, vote on whether or not to hand me over. <laughs> and they voted 98 to zero not to hand me over. And, um, and then Trump finally walked it back. But I mean, what a crazy and horrible thing. And I'll, I'll tell you something is that if Trump had been reelected um, in this latest election with Biden, I wouldn't have felt safe coming back to America. Like, like I, I don't feel safe going to South Africa right now. I follow. Well, I think we must make sure that you do feel safe to come back here. It'd be great to have you back in Cape Town and the Western Cape. But let me say this. I mean, this Trump story, there's a kind of bombshell in the middle of your book but, uh, for people who follow these things. That in the 2016 election campaign, which 
Trump against expectation, you noted uh, beat Hillary Clinton, there was this dossier that was actually produced, which seemed to suggest that there was a lot of compromise on Trump, golden showers and all other things, which Moscow held, and therefore he'd be, as you described, the Manchurian candidate of Moscow in the White House, which he could have been or might have been. Except there's a, there's a twist, because the stuff in the dossier was so obviously fake, or some of it, that your suggestion, it's, it's remarkable, but you've got to be quite sophisticated both to conceive this and then to expose it, that the operatives who put together that uh, dossier actually had some actual information there, which was compromising on Trump, but some incredible disinformation which allowed the entire dossier to be dismissed as Trump did as fake news. Can, can you just uh, elaborate? Well, so, yeah, so, so um, in 2016, um, uh, a guy named Glenn Simpson, who ran a firm called Fusion GPS, was hired by the um, Democratic National Committee to put together a dossier on Donald Trump. And, um, and so he hired a guy named Chris Steele, who is a former MI6 agent who had left Russia to do the lion's share of the work on this dossier. And um, what was very interesting, and this is unbelievably crazy, is that at the same time as Glenn Simpson was hired by the DNC to do a dossier on Trump, he had been hired by the Russian government effectively by the Russian government through, a, through a, a Russian lawyer named Natalia Veselnitskaya to do a dossier on me, um, to try to discredit me. And, um, and so basically at the same time as he's being paid by the Russian government, <laughs> he, he's to do their dirty work, um, he's being paid by the DNC to do something against the Russian government's interests because the Russian government wanted Donald Trump elected. And so it's my theory that, that um, the Russians were well aware, the Russians that were hired him to go after me were well aware that, that there was this dossier um, being created and they somehow found a way to slip this disinformation into the Trump dossier so that um, when it was finally uh, put into the open, um, it could be easily disproved and then everyone could say, look, fake news. And so it was really, for me, a very, uh, I'm, I'm Given my own experience with Trump, I, I definitely don't think uh, he should be the president of the United States. And um, and for everybody, and there were many people in the United States who who had had that feeling as well. And but for anyone who is holding on to that feeling um, and using the um, dossier as their justification, um, it was a very weak um, uh, leg to stand on, uh, and and potentially a very dangerous leg to um, to use to somehow say that Trump shouldn't be president. There's a lot of reasons why he shouldn't have been president, but that dossier wasn't one of them. There's also the fascinating uh, story in the book of what happened in Trump Tower, when the very same Kremlin operative or uh, Moscow lawyer who's running this campaign against you, uh, Natalia Veselitskaya, sorry, uh, was actually meeting with uh, Donald Trump's son, his yep. campaign yep. manager and his son-in-law, uh, Jared Kushner, uh, and they were discussing the question of adoptions, which is a shorthand because when Magnitsky Act was passed, Putin, in his very uh, soulless way, decided that he would ban any uh, American from adopting any Russian child. Many at-risk children simply died as a result of this decision, as you, you elaborate in the book. And yet, so what happens now is they have a meeting to discuss adoption. But that is really a code for getting rid of the Magnitsky Act on the assumption of the white of the Trump and the White House, which actually happens a few months later. Was there any attempt from the White House to roll back the Magnitsky Act, even though it had this enormous congressional support? Well, what's interesting is that the Magnitsky Act, um, it, as you say, is, was an act of Congress. And, and, and just to go back in time, back to, to the Obama days, when we first tried to get the Magnitsky Act put in place, uh, President Obama had something called the Russian reset. This was a policy where he was trying to reset relations with Russia. And what it really meant was appeasement. And um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, Obama did that were, were good, but this was one thing that was very, very bad. And his appeasement policy towards Russia was, was, was disastrous. And so in order to get the Magnitsky Act passed, so 
in theory, if he had been in support of the Magnitsky Act, he could have basically just um, done an executive order to say, an executive order means like his signature, he writes it down to say that we will freeze the assets and ban the visas of people who, who killed Magnitsky and do other human rights abuses. He could have done that, but he, he resisted. He didn't want the Magnitsky Act because he didn't want to upset Putin. And so the, in order to succeed in getting the Magnitsky Act passed, I had to go to Congress. And in America, the way the political system works, the way the constitution is written, is that the executive branch, the president's branch, is a co-equal branch of government to the legislative branch, to Congress. And when we were able to get 92 senators to pass the Magnitsky Act, um, the president, even if he didn't want it, which he didn't, had to do it. And so by, by Obama forcing our hand to get a, an act of Congress, um, it meant that when Trump came in and was asked by Putin's operatives um, to repeal the Magnitsky Act, he couldn't just make a stroke of the pen and get rid of it. And so as a result, to get anything done with Congress is almost impossible. You can't, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's just, it take, it's just, it's really impossible. It takes, sometimes take decades to get rid of something. And so um, the Magnitsky Act um, uh, was not uh, in any way touched by, by Donald Trump. And, um, uh, and in fact, now it's, um, uh, uh, it's, it's America has become one of the largest sanctioners of human rights abusers and kleptocrats of any country in the world. Now, I mean, there, it's not just the United States that has Magnitsky Act, there's Canada, there's UK, there's the European Union, there's Australia, there's Norway, et cetera. But the number of people sanctioned by the US is, is just dramatically big and, and very impressive and you know, includes those like the Guptas and, and other bad actors yeah. around the world. But uh, you know what's what's interesting. The, the other feature of this book is how you elaborate on Putin's love of money, and how he almost acts like a toll collector. You know, he takes a piece of the action, small piece of the action. In your case, you could trace about eight hundred thousand dollars of the two hundred and thirty million stolen. Well, actually, by the operatives in the Kremlin from the state, but actually from, from your company, which had paid tax and then was stolen back by the most extraordinary story. And he takes a piece, a slice of the action. And, and you, I think, tabulate about a trillion dollars worth of di dirty money, the proceeds of crime and corruption, which has been laundered out of Russia for the benefit of Putin and the nomenclature in the Kremlin. I, this is, even by any standards, is a staggering amount of money. And yeah. presumably, the uh, Magnitsky Act and more materially the sanctions after 24 February in the Ukraine invasion will prevent quite a lot of that money being relaundered or used. Do you think, are, are you impressed with the sanctions regime that has happened since the 24th of February? Um, it, it completely blows me away. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I couldn't have ever imagined anything like this happening. If you had told me six months ago that that Rom Roman Abramovich was going to be on the UK and, and EU sanctions list, and that um, uh, Oleg Deripaska, and, and I mean, these are all names, I don't know if people know or don't know, but these are big, the biggest oligarchs in Russia, the richest, richest, are now basically, you know, their yachts are unavailable to them, their bank accounts are frozen, and it's really just tragically unpleasant for them. Um, and I could have never imagined in my most optimistic um, dreams that, that this would happen. Now it's happened for a very, very heartbreaking reason, which is that, and, uh, and it, requi it required something so heartbreaking to, to make it happen, which was the mass murder on a daily basis of you know, hundreds and thousands of innocent civilians in Ukraine. But you know, we're now finally getting to what's important, which is going after the money that Vladimir Putin and his cronies have accumulated. So let's talk about the war in Ukraine, Bill. I mean, which you've been commenting a great deal, and you were, in a sense, the canary in the coal mine in terms of calling out Putin's, and you said that was a micro example of what now is a macro issue, uh, his behavior and his, uh, his, his, his rule-bending uh, uh, regime. You said in a recent interview that, Putin, in respect of Ukraine war, that Putin has no reverse gear. Yep, now, yep. Well, so what does that mean? Where is this going and how do you see it unwinding or not unwinding? Well, everybody asks me how it's going to end. And my prediction 
is that it doesn't end, um, that this goes on and on and on. Why do I predict that? Because um, as I said, Vladimir Putin doesn't have a reverse gear. He, he comes from a, a culture, a prison yard culture where you can never show weakness. If you show weakness, then your enemies will take you out like they would in a prison yard. And so Putin, now that he's started this war, he can only escalate it. He can't give up, he can't peace treaty, he can't negotiate, because any of those things are a sign of weakness. He needs to destroy his enemy. On the other hand, Putin is um, not that good. <laughs> he's, he's a tin pot dictator who, we, we thought he was running a, the second most powerful army in the world, and it turns out to be a third world army. You know, they, they've stolen their all, the, you know, all the, the soldiers have stolen all the supplies and sold them on the black market. I heard a story the other day about um, some Ukrainian military officials who basically went to the Russian soldiers in their tank and said, listen, we'll pay you 25 grand to buy your tank. And these are $2 million tanks. Just, just, just give them your, give us your tank. And they sold them two tanks. And they said, and by the way, come back for, we got more money if you want to come back with more tanks. Um, and, and, and so, um, Putin is, is, he's doing really badly in this war. It's, it's, it's humiliating. And so he's, he's not getting where he wants to be. And I think from my perspective, that, that only leads to one, one possible outcome, which is escalation. And, I, and I, I know about this guy because I've been fighting with him for a decade and I know how he operates. Whenever you think you've gotten the better of him, he just does something crazy and un, unexpected and maybe even self-destructive to escalate. So I, I, you know, I don't think Putin is ever gonna stop. And I also know that the Ukrainians now have, have you know, the, what, what's been, the crimes that have been inflicted on them is just have been so heartbreaking and so awful. I mean, this, in Bucha, this, you know, killing people with their hands tied behind their backs and the mass rape of women, I mean, it's just horrible. And I, I don't think that anyone in that country will allow any type of concession whatsoever, even if that was something that, that would lead to a, uh, uh, peace. There's no way that they're going to allow any of their territory to be taken by the Russians, and they're doing well enough, so they shouldn't. They should go off. They should carry on and try to defeat the Russians. But the problem is that that um, uh, I, you know it's it's unlikely that 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 they'll be totally defeated. And it's unlikely that the Russians will totally defeat them. And so, what's the most likely scenario? Is is uh, you know a, a, a not not even low simmering, but high simmering war that just carries on and on and on. And the really scary part of that scenario is that um, time is on Putin's side, not on our side. Because if, if Putin carries on with this, oil prices will stay high, gas prices will stay high, food prices will stay high. Um, people will start getting tired of refugees in, in all these countries. And what, that, what does that lead to? That leads to populism. And populism leads to new leaders in democratic elections. And those new leaders may not have the same attitude that, that with the Western world has right now towards Russia with all these sanctions and military aid. And so Putin is hoping, and, and, and probably the biggest risk right now is the 2024 elections in the United States and Donald Trump comes back in and he says, you know, what do, why, what do we care about what's going on in Ukraine? You know, let Putin have it. That, that's, that's a very likely scenario. And so it's, um, I, I think that, that you know, there, it's, there's an unlikely scenario that, that Ukraine wins, and, I, and it's not that unlikely because they're doing pretty well. Um, uh, and if that were to happen, Putin would get immediately replaced by, by the people of Russia. Um, the, the Russians cannot stand weak losers. And so we have to do everything we can to help the, the Ukrainians win because that's the only sort of acceptable scenario from a Western standpoint. Yeah, but it does seem to have stiffened the spine of the West, this invasion, in a way that certainly as you chronicle, the enabling of Putin by the West seems, as you said, to have gone into retreat. So we've got a few minutes left, Bill, and thank you for being so generous with your time and being so candid as you're on the book. And I'm going to facilitate the asking of questions in the sense that it's got to come through me, apparently, because you might not hear it there. But anyway, I'll do my best to you. be your scribe, stenographer for Bill Browder. It's a great honor. Right. Mr. Arik, yes. Bill. Oh, will you hear? Can you hear? Just this check. Let, let, let's, let's try it out. Hello, one, two. Can you hear that, Bill? I, I heard a hello, one, two. So if that's I the. That's all I said. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Bill, from what you know of the Russian oligarchy and the 
security circles around Putin, what are the odds, if at all, of him ever facing a Slobodan Milosevic moment in the Hague? Um, well, so first of all, I, I don't believe that the oligarchs are ever going to rise up and try to um, hand Putin over to, to the war crimes tribunal. I don't think the, the oligarchs are so scared of, of what Putin could do to them. I mean, and he, and he has done to this terrible things to them in the past and to, to some of them that, you know, at any moment, if they even look at him askance, he'll take their money away, put them in jail or kill them. And so the oligarchs are not going to be helpful to him. And he's so carefully scrubbed his security services of, of disloyalty. I don't think there's any chance of that happening. And, and, and of course, I'm sure all of you will remember that long table he sits at. Why is he sitting at that long table? He's, he's worrying about, a, you know, somebody taking him out, somebody close to him taking him out. He's a paranoid he old man. Sick? Sorry to interrupt. There's reports that he's very ill. Do you think there's any credibility on that? Well, I, I was actually just um, last night having dinner with a friend of mine who is a um, very sort of high level doctor who says that um, he, he's got moon face, which is something you get from taking uh, cortisone um, on a continuous basis. And, and um, you know, he doesn't look well, but I, I've heard so many stories about his supposed sickness over the years that I, I wouldn't, if that's the only basis which we have hope for, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, have hope on that basis. You know, we might get lucky and that he just drops dead and that's the end of Putin, but um, I think we should expect that, that he's going to be around for a lot longer. Right. Over there, Peter. Hi, uh, Bill. This is a, really a follow-up to Arik's question. Um, do you think there's any possibility that Putin would be taken out as Khrushchev was in 1964? I know there's no Politburo, uh, and you talked about the security service being scrubbed of anybody who might be a dissident, but surely as the situation in Russia gets worse, the economy gets worse, they look as though they're losing the war. Isn't that the one way that he could be taken out and disappear, hopefully? Well, I, I, I think the one way he could get taken out and disappeared is if he, if, if the Russians actually saw how badly they were doing, I mean, you know, it really is, it's, it's humiliating how badly they're doing right now. You know, that, that their army, there was a story yesterday that I read in the Telegraph about how the Russian, there was a, a, a battalion trying to cross a river um, in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians were able to kill a thousand Russian soldiers in this one incident, and, and effectively the whole battalion. I mean, it's just, and they, you know, they've sunk two major warships in in the Black Sea, and and it's just unbelievable how badly they're doing. And if if the Russians knew that, I think that that by itself would lead to Putin being um, deposed, not by you know some uh, KGB operative around him, but but I think that the people of Russia would say, wait a second, what, what have you gotten us into? Why is everyone getting killed? Why is our economy crashing for your stupidity when you, didn't even, you couldn't even organize this? And I think that, that that's the kind of thing where, you know, the, the gas prices go up by 50% and all of a sudden, you know, there's, you know, fires and, and bombs in the streets of Moscow and other cities in Russia as people just have had enough of their government. That, that's the kind of thing that could, could lead to it. And, and it's a much more dangerous situation for Putin now than it's ever been before. He's gone way out on a limb here um, with this war. And so, you know, it's impossible to predict what, what events might lead to his downfall, but I'd say there's much more likely now than it was six months ago. Great. Uh, Arjun? Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you for your book and congratulations on your work. I just want to bring it back home a bit closer. We are trying to find out what sits behind South Africa's support of Russia. Besides the historical relationships, we have uncovered a very close monetary relationship between Victor Vexelberg and a manganese mine in South Africa that funds our governing party, the ANC, is now in fact its biggest funder. Um, can you maybe tell us something about Vexelberg, what you have picked up about him, how high up he is in the ranks with Putin, um, and maybe some tips on how we could uh, dig further into this story? Thank you. Sorry, Adrian, just for background, is the editor-in-chief of News24, which is our well, Potron, because sponsor of ours, is a very the biggest uh, website, news website in South Africa. Well, uh, first of all, that is outrageously interesting information. If the, if the largest contributor 
to the African National Congress um, is a company connected to uh, a sanctioned Russian oligarch who's been sanctioned all the way back in 2000, uh, I think it was 2017 by the US government. <clears throat> he was one of the first people sanctioned. And it's now he's on everybody's sanctions list. That's an outrageous situation. And it explains a lot in my, in my, in my mind. I mean, I, I've been scratching my head and trying to understand how the African National Congress, how the, the government of South Africa can um, support Putin in this situation. And, and, and I'll have, I have to say something, which is, um, and every time I'm speaking to South Africans, I say this, which is that I personally and, ev and everybody I knew, you know, went out on all sorts of limbs and, and made all sorts of efforts to try to end apartheid in South Africa, you know, uh, uh, demonstrating on campus, disinvesting, um, trying to create a, a situation to save South Africa from this terrible apartheid regime. It was the West, the United States, Western Europe, the United Kingdom that did this. And, and South Africa is a free country right now. And South Africa, by, by turning its back on the West and siding with Putin, is an enormous betrayal, which, which I and many other people are not going to forget. Well, that's a very powerful note on which I think we should end this discussion. Let me thank you very much, Bill. Really appreciate your time. Great book. There are copies, I'm told, outside that you can buy. Unfortunately, you can't sign them in person. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, hopefully, the day will come before too long that you can do that exercise, revisit Cape Town, and go to your home. <laughs> and, Bill, great success uh, with everything going forward. Thank you so much for being such a great audience and listening to this link with such uh, concentration. And thank you for participating in the Front Shook Literary Festival.